Welcome to the panel. So we are, I'm very happy to be here today with my fellow classmates from 1996. To give you a little context, I was just checking the uh, number one and number two Billboard songs in 1996. Uh, number one was the Grease Mega Mix with Olivia Newton-John and John Travolta. Uh, and number two was the Macarena. Uh, I think the top shows were ER and Seinfeld, for those of you who are more TV watchers, to give you a little bit of context to that. So we were, we were lucky enough to come out of school in the early days of the, uh, the dot-com boom. Of course, it was called that in, in, in retrospect, not prospectively. So the Mozilla browser, I think, came out in, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, NCSA browser came out in 1995. I still remember Kevin, so Kevin was the president of our MBA class, and he had somehow um, worked his way into the executive education infrastructure and had gotten a chance to teach a class to executives on kind of this internet and web thing. And I remember he asked me to co-teach it. And at the beginning, one of us stood up and said, how many of you have email accounts? Did a third of them raise their hands? Not even. Um, and of course, now we're in the post-email age where you know my life is very heavily email-based, and then I talk to undergraduates here at the university, and do not try to send them information in email. That is not how they work. They work all through sort of Twitter and Facebook and those kinds of things. So we're a few generations away. But I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about the, the dot-com journey and what we have learned along the way, and why don't we just do introductions, starting way down on the end with John Hankey. Uh, okay, I'm John Hankey. Um, I'm currently a VP at Google. Um, I guess going back before business school, I was in government, and uh, I wanted to make, I guess, what people would call today as a pivot. I <laughs> had been kind of a self-taught programmer as a kid, and I wanted to get into the technology industry, and so I moved from the East Coast out here to California without knowing a soul, I had no business contacts, I had no experience in business, I basically knew nothing. And showed up and basically just sort of sopped up everything that the school had to offer for two years. Got a huge amount out of the entrepreneurship program. People like Jerry Engel were incredibly, incredibly helpful to, to sort of get me acclimated to you know what was going on out here. Um, I got roped into a company that a classmate of mine, Steve Sellers, Steve's on the East Coast now, I doubt he's here today was starting, it was he and his brother and these two other brothers, and basically the, there were two sets of brothers and they didn't get along. So they wanted another guy to kind of like be the tiebreaker guy, I guess. So I got looped into this company, it was doing a very cool thing, it was the first massively multiplayer 3D game on the, the internet, which as Andre mentioned was just kind of becoming a platform uh, for business, commercial opportunities, and uh, so this game thing actually worked, and we ended up um, actually selling it to a public company, the 3DO company. We signed the letter of intent for that uh, the day of graduation, I think, or the day before graduation. So it was, of course, you know, the subject of all of our class projects and everything was a great kind of learning exercise, and that kind of, I guess, in a way, you know, was my entree into a career in California, in the Valley, and in technology. And uh, started another company after that, and then this company called Keyhole, which did this kind of earth browsing thing that was acquired by Google in 2004. And is now people. <laughs> so I'm Jed Katz, also class of 96. Uh, let's see, when John says he entered the class knowing next to nothing, I think I knew about half of what John knew. And um, I remember in the first uh, month, you know, you're trying to meet everybody you can, and it's just information overload. And then I, I, I meet Kevin, and Kevin shows me what the Internet is. I was one of those guys that didn't have an email account, had never been on email. And it just blew me away. And, and all of a sudden, all these ideas started coming into my head. And um, I had to start a business because it was all going to happen right then. And so uh, the first logical thing for, for me to start um, had to do with apartment finding because my, uh, a friend of mine was going to law school at the time uh, at Hastings and he kept going back and forth from LA where he lived to try to find an apartment and he couldn't find one and go back to LA, come back the next weekend and I was thinking, well, there, there's got to be a better way to do this. Uh, so together we learned HTML 1.0 and started throwing uh, uh, photos and floor pans up and uh, typing in information about apartment buildings. 
And then, um, you know, at the same time, I was trying to uh, go through the MBA program, uh, and things just started accelerating. And, and uh, you know, I guess one of the lessons I learned is if you, if you all of a sudden realize you have a great idea and you have this major head start, you got to speed up. And so we, um, we spent all our time contacting every apartment building in the country and um, getting them to understand what this thing called the Internet was and getting their photos and floor plans and scanning everything in and typing everything in <clears throat> and then uh, programming at night. And um, over the course of, I think, the first year of the program, we were able to get a, uh, a ton of apartment buildings in, in every state and started charging them higher and higher fees to advertise on our system. Uh, and... We, at the time, I think Yahoo came out and some of the other search engines came out, and uh, we became some of their very first advertisers. So um, we were able to generate traffic pretty quickly and uh, grew the traffic and the apartment buildings at the same time so that it, it really turned into a, a good little system there. Um, by the end of the program, we had roughly 95% of uh, all large apartment buildings in the country advertising with us as well as a bunch of moving services, and I had sold the company before I graduated to um, a pretty big uh, Fortune 500 company. Um, after we graduated, we kept running the business. They just let us do our thing because they didn't have any Internet guys. They didn't even know what really the Internet was yet either. And uh, we just kept building our business and creating our culture and, uh, and hitting our numbers. Um, Later, we ended up spinning off from that company and using the same team and infrastructure to create uh, Move.com, which was everything RentNet was, the first apartment guide, uh, but also homes and mortgages and moving services and all that. And we built that for a couple years, um, intended to take it public, and uh, started the roadshow in March of uh, 2000, which was <laughs> flawless timing. Um, <laughs> Luckily, there was a real business there, so we kept building it and then ended up uh, selling it for uh, a pretty decent number in uh, February of 2001 to our biggest competitor, who then five years later realized that Move.com was a much better name than they had, and they uh, finally changed their name to Move.com, so it's still a public company today. Um, since then, I've done a lot of angel investing. I helped create a product called the Sky Scout which is a uh, handheld GPS-enabled device that can uh, identify or find anything in the sky and tell you all about it. And then I um, moved to the other side of the table and became a venture capitalist uh, for DFJ, Gotham in New York. Uh, did that for four years and then had a chance to join another classmate of mine who, um, I, I don't think he's here today, but he'll be uh, at the event tonight, uh, Noah Doyle, and start a venture capital fund here. And... Um, that was a few years ago. Uh, our first fund was $75 million. We just closed our second fund, which is just over $100 million, doing early-stage investing. My name is Ben Wilson. Uh, I was an MBA and an MPH student when I was at uh, Haas. So I actually en entered a year before um, my colleagues here and then uh, graduated with them with two degrees. So I had a healthcare focus. And uh, prior, and now I'm a director of global healthcare strategy at Intel. And uh, prior to coming to Haas, I worked for a, a payer called Take Care Health Plan as a uh, marketing communications manager. And so uh, I also wanted to do something different to have more of an impact to be able to uh, possibly start a company. When I, and so I came back to Haas, and the joint degree was a, a, a great vehicle for that. And uh, so shortly um, after Haas, I had the opportunity to start up the healthcare business for a company called babycenter.com, which is still the largest website for new and expectant parents. It was, it was a great model because uh, you could attract people at a very uh, high information intensive point of their lives when they really want information and they spend about $7,000 within a very short period of time on products on average, and, and every, all of them go through sort of the same stage. Uh, you know, we, we, we're just capturing their due date um, and their email address. We're able to give them a lot of personalized information on a weekly basis uh, and grow uh, the membership. And uh, so I, I, I started uh, the healthcare business where we sold e-health portals to health plans and to hospitals, and uh, we had lots of health plans um, that were using our product to communicate with their uh, members. Uh, then, and so I'm, I'm also the one, I, only person that represents a, a dot bomb, I think, on this <laughs> panel as well. So I, I bring a lot of diversity to the panel. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so the uh, we were Baby Center was acquired by eToys, and in '98, and uh, and we had a the fifth largest IPO of all time. It was very fun, uh, very exciting, and then the the stock started to plunge. Uh, we had a you know larger market cap than Toys R Us. Uh, you know they had thousands of warehouses and stores, and and we had a website and one warehouse, and we had a larger uh, market cap. Uh, which didn't make a lot of sense. And so the market picked up on that eventually. <laughs> so, um, but luckily I was actually part of a B&B division of, of um, eToys and they were a consumer company and they decided to spin us out. So I became uh, the president of an independent company. We had new investors. It was called Consumer Health Interactive and I soon had you know, 50 employees reporting to me and we sold that company to uh, pharmacy benefit management company uh, within about a, a year uh, called Advanced PCS. And uh, so it was a, a, a great experience going from, you know, a communications manager to, uh, to running a company within, a, you know, within two years, which I think uh, doing something at that point in time, I was sort of the prototypical dot-commer in that uh, didn't have a lot of experience, got into situations where um, I normally would not have gotten that level of responsibility, and and then I uh, got to write it down as well and see what it's like when things don't go so well, and uh, and 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 rode that market out. I also uh, and then after that I I joined a company called uh, CanDo.com, uh, and and uh, and. That was similar to Baby Center in that it was a baby center basically for people with disabilities and uh, most of you with mobility disabilities. And that com I joined that company in September of, of uh, 2000 and uh, it just it was very bad timing and uh, also d there was not a good business model there. We, unlike uh, parents, uh, people with disabilities don't have the same money and, and the, the things that they purchase tend to be medical products and we had to have special licenses to be able to sell that so there were some issues with the business model. It was, a, uh, but at the time it seemed like a, a very glamorous opportunity that I jumped to and I think that, that was a great learning experience in terms of the, the venture capitalists were top-notch venture capitalists. The board had, you know, uh, Ted Kennedy Jr. was on the board. There were some pe well-known people on the board. And that made it se seem very exciting and new. But the, at the end of the day, it's really the business model and can you create value. And so the, the market sort of at the end of the day said that's something we would don't want to continue to fund. Um, so then I had to reinvent myself as a healthcare IT person. I'd been sort of this consumer content healthcare person. I reinvented myself as a healthcare IT person, and, and now I'm at Intel. That's great. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm constantly reminded about uh, you know how transformative Haas was for me, and uh, you know what a great place for a phase change. And it was you know the people in my class that I learned just as much as you know the great professors I had. And uh, so I started out uh, in consulting. I did uh, uh, econ undergrad here at Berkeley. I went into economics and finance research for litigation. So basically fighting over money that people lost eight years ago and uh, studying those industries. But it was a great pre-MBA job because we got you know, really skilled at accounting, finance, legal, Excel spreadsheets, everything. And I actually had a little extra time on my hands when I arrived at business school because I was pretty good at those things already. And uh, so we put that to, to pretty quick work because in you know, 1993, we, you know, we were kind of geeks and you know, we were doing a lot of research using the mainframes at Stanford and programming in Fox Pro. And you know, uh, you know, we, we used technology quite a bit as analysts and uh, we got our first copy of the Mosaic browser in 1993 and we flipped because we knew how to do it at the Unix command line and you know, do 17 different steps replaced by a click. And uh, we just, we freaked. We said, this is going to be very important. So we came in uh, and sort of uh, soon found that you know, part of our class, you know, there were a number of people that were seeing the same opportunity and were getting excited and wanted to go do something. And even people like myself who'd never done anything entrepreneurial you know, professionally, 
uh, you know, we're saying that, that you know, that this is something that's too big, too much of an opportunity. So uh, we, we actually, uh, you know, uh, had a lot of freedom in the business, you know, program here to, uh, to, to go explore things and do things. So we actually built software. Here we collaborated with, you know, PhD students from the computer science program. We were teaching classes in the exec program. I mean, we were just getting very involved. And the, the freedom to do that and kind of pursue that passion uh, for 100 hours a week uh, it's very difficult to replicate that if you have a day job. <laughs> and uh, th and that, that for me was important because I made a very substantial phase change. I you know, took a pay cut from my pre-MBA jobs and went in and helped start a company here on campus uh, called Ink to Me. So uh, Ink to Me uh, was, uh, you know, there are two guys, a professor and a grad student in the computer science department who had been working on a new way to build very large supercomputing systems out of a lot of small parts and uh, called the Network of Workstations Project. And they had a, 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 a sort of a test search engine up called inktome.berkeley.edu. And it was about 10x better, 10x faster and able to scale. And we'd seen the web go from like, you know, there was a page on the Mosaic uh, web page that was the What's New page. It had all the new websites that had come on that day. <laughs> 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 At first there were like four or five, <laughs> and then there were 25, and then the page went away. <laughs> and, you know, and this is one of those things where you just you feel and you see something and, you know, and for me I said this is going to break, this is going to fundamentally break all the technologies that exist today because none of them are designed for web scale, for internet scale. And so what I saw at Ink to me was a fundamental technology that could scale to hold all the information in the world and uh, could keep up with these kind of millions of users, millions of documents, these kind of challenges. So uh, we'd actually been pr working on a project. We merged our project from the business school, which was uh, one of the very early advertising engines. Uh, we called it Audience One. Uh, and we merged that into Ink to Me. And they didn't have any money yet because they didn't have funding. They said, well, we're, we're going to buy your project from you, uh, but we don't have any money. So if we get funded, we'll, we'll pay for it. And so uh, we ended up getting some angel funding, and then we got uh, venture financed. Uh, so we, we uh, basically started making search engine technology, but we wanted to do a very different strategy. So we did, you know, kind of ink to me inside. We were the technology uh, inside other companies. So we were the seventh to market. Now I just turned down very lucrative, you know, consulting jobs, and you know everyone's going the seventh search engine. Who needs a freaking search engine? <laughs> and uh, but we took we had both a technology advantage that I saw because the internet was going to grow a lot, and a business innovation which was you know we're going to take this OEM strategy. And so we ended up going from zero to uh, you know, seventh to market to number one in market share in about two and a half years. Uh, we were kings of the mountain before it was a really big mountain like uh, Google owns today. Uh, but there, there's, you know, these are the technology waves that, that, that you catch and ride. And uh, so uh, we all also branched off, did some other technology. So we grew that company from zero to $200 million in about four and a half years. And uh, this was not like, you know, ad barter revenue. This was like real telcos and, you know, other people writing big checks or paying by the search. Uh, so we had a very robust business. But the thing that was crazy was, as, uh, you know, as impressive as that was, the, the market cap, uh, we went public and you know, it was just ridiculous. It was just stupid ridiculous, much like uh, uh, you know, sort of some of the other companies. And we wrote it up and we wrote it down because all of our customers, all the telcos, all the you know, web portals, et cetera, they hit pretty hard times. So we had to you know, both experience both the up and the down. We ended up selling it to Yahoo. I'd been there seven years. Uh, and I had to walk into the CEO's company and say, hey, look, a lot of our customers are dying. This might be a good chance to do some vertical integration and park us with one of the properties that's going to continue to have the right property uh, or the right, you know, traffic. So we did that. And it was still the number two search technology up until just a couple of years ago. Um, and so, you know, I'd been there seven years, you know, had, had done well, and I popped out there and I said, now what? So I ended up doing some, uh, some volunteer work for the U.S. military. Uh, helping them think about the UAV programs, the very early UAV programs, uh, because I'd had a team of 200 engineers working for me building big distributed networks, and the ne next generation of surveillance, you know, aircraft were like three foot wingspan, and 10,000 bucks each, and you put a thousand up over a border or over a, a war zone. So I, I was just helping think that. It was actually a Berkeley based project, there were a bunch of uh, academic researchers in it too. And uh, that got me interested in some of the security aspects. So I went and joined a company that was doing cryptography. Now, I'd, I'd never done any security or cryptography, anything, but it was doing it for storage. So how do we, you know, secure all your, like, credit card numbers or your healthcare data? You know, remember when all those backup, backup tapes were falling off the back of trucks, <laughs> right? You get those letters again and again. And uh, we, we saw that and we're like, 
this is crazy. I, I didn't know it until I got into technology, but you know, n there's no security for this data that's like you know, flying around the, the, you know, in trucks and on the battlefield and everywhere. And so I ended up going to this company called Decrew, and we had to create a market. It was tough work. And we had to convince people that, hey, if, if you're on the battlefield or it's a backup tape you know, on a truck, you should probably encrypt it. And so uh, we, we basically you know, emerged, got to number one share in that market, and then were purchased by uh, NetApp, which is one of the big storage companies. So uh, this, for me, I'd been a you know, sort of a startup, you know, but either consultant or startup person the whole time. I said, this is a chance to go to school. NetApp had been a great company, great, great sort of background. I said, you know, this, is a, this is a great opportunity. So I stayed on as a VP there and learned a lot uh, and, you know, got, you know, sort of, you know, I'd been doing networking, storage, security, you know, I'm a plumber, right? So I was, you know, learning about, you know, all of the, the stuff. But after a while, you know, just, you know, the, the politics inside the big company just started to get to me. I'm a startup guy. And, uh, you know, was, I, I likened it to a battleship in which 80% of the gunfire goes off in the hull of the ship, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to out the portholes. So I said, I'm out of here. And uh, so I went and uh, ran a virtualization company called Kidaro. It was actually out of uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. There were no U.S. employees. Uh, and so I ended up being CEO. I was flying back to Tel Aviv every six weeks. I went from zero to gold elite in five months. <laughs> Pretty tough. But, uh, but it was a fascinating technology for desktop virtualization. And uh, we were kind of strapped in to go you know, as long as needed. And we were well funded. And Microsoft caught, you know, sort of wind of it, and we said, well, there's two things we can help you with Microsoft. One of them is VMware. They're coming for you. They want to shim between the operating system and the hardware, and they're going to turn you into a dumb repository for print drivers. But that's, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not your biggest problem. Your biggest problem is a little problem called Vista. And it's actually not called Vista. It's called every new version of the operating system you ever roll out is very difficult to transition to because people have 900 applications they run their business on, and only 813 of them are going to run on your new one. And it was killing them, killing Microsoft. So we said, how about this? We'll run an invisible copy of your old OS inside the, you know, the new OS, and the old apps can run there. Problem solved. So th they came over the top. We were a two-year-old company. They paid almost 100 million bucks for us. We had like, you know, a million in revenue. We're like, all right, fine. They doubled their offer and we're like, okay, done, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> which actually turns out, back to the luck thing, I, I was sitting in Professor Ocker's uh, lecture, which was excellent uh, earlier, and he said, luck, very important, because this is right before the 2008 crash. So I ended up taking, you know, about 18 months off. I stayed like seven weeks at Microsoft because uh, they didn't need me and I, I didn't want to move to Redmond. And so I looked and looked and looked. I looked at 130 companies because by this point I realized that there's a big difference between look mode and strap-in mode. All of the whining and dining and romance, just boom, it's done. <laughs> Make your numbers, <laughs> right? So uh, I came across a company, a very disruptive company. Uh, uh, so I, I've been a VP at NetApp in the you know, storage industry. This is a company I'd never heard of. They had 1,000 customers. They had invented a way to use raw Ethernet networks to connect storage that would go faster than the old stuff at about one-fifth to one-tenth the cost in a $30 billion market. They had 1,000 customers. We called the customers. They said, this stuff is great. And it takes 60 seconds to install the box. And I was like, really? <laughs> and they had no sales and marketing. It was like the Office of Sales Prevention. Right, <laughs> and, and we're like, well, we know how to do that, and you know, so we brought in, and so we, you know, that was about 15 months ago, and uh, so I, I brought in an executive team, and uh, we've uh, approximately, uh, you know, multiplied the revenue by about four or five times in 15 months. Uh, so we're at, at a very steep growth rate, a little bit under triple, uh, and uh, we've raised 35 million dollars in funding, and we're just we're going after the big guys, and uh, so we're starting to win big accounts like Ford and GE and Sony and Disney. Uh, a bunch of universities, and you know, we're just out there and doing our thing. I, it, and in the end of the day, you, you always have to keep learning. You always want to surround yourself with great people that challenge you, and that's that's the experience I had at Haas, and that's why I keep coming back, and that's why a lot of my friends are from Haas, and many of the people in the audience here. And uh, just you know, it's about how do you stay young and you know, really you know, just stay learning and and just be aggressive and go. And uh, that that's the fun part about finding a problem to solve. And uh, so, you know, it's always refreshing to come back and, and talk to people and bounce those things off, and I learn something every time. So, unfortunately, Rhonda Schrader couldn't 
join us today. She was going to be the other person on the panel. Now, speaking of the internet, she, um, she actually told us, because she has in-flight Wi-Fi, I believe, because um, she's on an airplane right now. Uh, in terms of my background, so, so before I got to Haas, I was actually working on the Genome Project at MIT as a software engineer. And strangely enough, I actually started working on the internet in high school, and I'm not a young person. Um, and uh, I always think it's funny that Unix is under this thing. Um, on the internet. But, so I was doing internet stuff before I came to business school, and then it was sort of a crazy process of getting through this. I actually did three dot-coms in four years, so one called Cybergold with a local entrepreneur, um, and that one ended up going public. Uh, another called Accept.com that was basically financial transactions and was sold to Amazon, and I've, I've been told is still their financial back-end because the same software engineers are there, uh, and a third one called IPix that was in the internet imaging space. So uh, the first, our first business was virtual tours of real estate. So if you're like shop for real estate and see those 360 degree views, so we created a, a North American network of photographers that could take those 360 degree views, put them up uh, online. We could syndicate the content with all the major real estate portals. Uh, and then we built this massively scalable back end actually by, I won't say I poached one of Kevin's software engineers because I think he'd already left, but one of, one of the geniuses Kevin had pulled out of Berkeley, um, somehow I convinced him to, to come work for me and he built our scalable back end and, and that's the back end for eBay pictures. So when you shop uh, in online auctions. And then after that I went into the pharmaceutical industry and did a couple startups there. Um, really taking that Silicon Valley business model and trying to apply that to the pharmaceutical industry. One was inside a large company called Eli Lilly and figuring out a way, how could you do a full drug development process in humans using 100% outsourcing a group called Chorus. And Chorus right now runs 15 full-scale drug development programs in phase one and phase two with just 29 people. Um, which, and, and just to give you an idea, typically a drug development team is, is 10 to 15 people. Um, so they're doing 15 programs with 29 people. And they're about twice as fast and between one-sixth and one-tenth the cost to actually get uh, data on compounds. And that's really just taking the Silicon Valley startup model. And then the company I started after that was actually a three-person pharmaceutical company. So a global pharmaceutical company with no labs. Uh, our poor chemist, I always feel bad for him, Ken, he's this brilliant uh, graduate of MIT, and he actually designs all the, the pharmaceutical molecules on a computer, and then we have other people synthesize them, and other people test them, and, you know, between FedEx and uh, uh, laboratories in India and China and places like that, um, have basically a, a full-scale, early-phase pharmaceutical company with just three people. So one of the things I thought would be interesting is, everybody in the entrepreneurship class? Yep. Okay. Uh, business plan idea, and what happened to it? Kevin? So uh, uh, Haas gets a lot of credit here uh, because uh, we actually wrote the business plan for Ink to Me uh, here uh, in, in class. So uh, th this is part of that, that comment of uh, getting the benefit of your classmates and you know, now you know, all my friends who are alumni. Uh, th that, that helped greatly to kind of harden that. So I, I'd, I'd say that uh, uh, we, we, we took that public and you know, I'd, I'd say that was a pretty good one. I, yeah, I had the benefit of not only being able to use, develop a business plan in the entrepreneurship class, but with our three-year program, we had a six-month residency where we could go out and, and, and work in the field for six months. And, and I chose to work with a small company to develop their business plan and then, uh, and then shop that to venture capitalists. And, uh, and so that company still exists, and, there, and the, it was electronic medical records that focused on outcomes. And, uh, but at the time, the founders decided not to accept venture funding, and so we went different ways. But uh, it was a great experience. Uh, yeah, so f for me, I was neck deep in running RentNet by the time that class came around. And, uh, you know, these guys hit the nail on the head. <laughs> the entrepreneurship class and new venture finance and about seven other classes for me was free consulting. <laughs> so uh, I used RentNet as the focus of as many projects as I possibly could. And uh, it was it was a tremendous amount of help. So the entrepreneurship class was one of the few classes where uh, we didn't use Archetype, which was the startup that I was working on with Steve. Um, actually, we were in a group together. Andre. Yes, we were. <clears throat> Do you remember the name of our product? Um, your time. Your time. Oh, is that what? Oh, yeah. Because so, originally it was Maximizer. Right? That's right. That's right. So it was a City Search clone, right? So it, it didn't. Well, they cloned us. It, it, it didn't turn us. into a real company, and it's probably a good thing that it didn't turn into a real company. But, um, but yeah, it was kind of a cool idea. It still doesn't really exist. In fact, somebody at Google pitched me this idea the other day, and I said, 
I remember that idea. <laughs> uh, and it was essentially a recommendation engine about events. So it would like, you know, the idea was it would tell you cool stuff that's going on in your community, in your city, and sort of help you kind of maximize your time and do like really useful cool stuff with it. Someday, John. Someday. We'll, yes. we'll circle back we'll on that back one and do it, do it together. Okay. Craziest dot com, pithy dot com story. Can I go first? I'll go first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you said pithy. So. Pithy, right. Okay. So, uh, so uh, I started a company called uh, Accept.com. We got funded by Kleiner Perkins and Benchmark Capital. They decided they, want, they wanted to bring in their own CEO, for which they said, you know, we'll fund you if we have our CEO. And my co-founder and I said, for your money, yes, we'll do that. So, so I left. And, and the same night I left, which was a, obviously a day of very mixed emotions for me, so this company we've been working on for a couple of years and started, and handed it off to a new CEO with you know, really great VCs, incredible board, and everything on its path. And I literally, I got home, and I, I lived in the Berkeley Hills, and I'm sitting on my deck, and I'm drinking a glass of wine, and the sun's setting, and my phone rings, and it's my classmate, Andy Lazo, and he says, Andre, I hear you're not doing anything. And I, I still, to this day, Andy will not tell me how he found out I, ju I just left. He said, I met these 25-year-old guys from Toronto, Canada, and they have this idea about virtual tours of real estate, and they want to do it. So I, 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 and he kept pestering me, so I finally met with, with these, um, I'll call them kids. You're, you're not a kid when you're 25, but they, they seem young to me because I was all, you know, I was probably 34 or something. But, um, but uh, so they had this idea about doing virtual tours of real estate, and they've been doing it in Canada, and I thought it was, you know, interesting and that kind of stuff, but maybe not the right team. And then one of them, his, his father came, and his father had started uh, a couple companies in Canada from the ground up, taking them public. He'd been the top computer sales at salesman at IBM. He was like A number one, amazing guy. He said he was going to join as the CEO. I said, hmm, now I'm interested. So I started working on the business plan, kind of lined up some VC meetings. And before we'd had our first VC meeting in January of 1999, he brought the senior management team together and he said, we're going public in nine months. And we all sort of like looked around the table like, Len, you know, <laughs> you know, we know you're good, but whatever. I mean, no one said anything, right? Um, so, uh, so this is before our first venture round or anything. He had investment bankers in there and everything. We went public in eight months. Well so, there, that's my crazy story. So, I, I, I've got one. So, uh, back, way, way back in the early days of Ink to Me, uh, uh, there'd been uh, Adam Saw, who's the programmer, and I, who'd uh, been working over here, and then uh, Eric Brewer and Paul Gautier, his students. So, you know, there were the four of us and a couple other folks coming in. We went back because we attracted some angel investors, and, and they were uh, from the East Coast. They'd made their money in restaurants. And uh, so we, we refer to them as the big belt buckle guys because they all do you know, southern drawl <laughs> and big belt buckles. And, you know, they didn't know anything about the Internet. But they knew that we were onto something somehow. And so they, they gave us our first, I think, $2 million in seed funding. And so we flew back to meet them for the first time. And I'm still in, in, at Haas. Uh, you know, we're just kind of getting this thing going. And we fly back there and they say, gentlemen, We've got a great thing lined up. You are going to be so excited. You've got this search technology and scalable you know, uh, sort of underpinnings, and we have done a deal with Marvel Comics. We have licensed the Spider-Man brand. Web, you get it? <laughs> <laughs> it's the Spider-Man search engine. <laughs> and, and Eric and I were there. We're like... NFW. <laughs> no way, because we, 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 we saw ourselves as a technology company and, you know, and these guys, you know, niching ourselves into some crazy brand. And I, it was one of those moments where I just had to sort of take a breath and say, we're not doing that. We're going to be inked to me inside. We have a strategy that's going to allow us to go and, and leverage many of the other top brands. And we ended up winning Yahoo and AOL and MSN and about 100 other portals and transitioning our, the rest of our business to a technology you know, for networking. And it, it was the right call, but uh, I thought I was going to get fired <laughs> before we really had even gotten started. And it was just one of those moments where you know, it's, it's a reminder that sometimes you know, just you come to those moments in real time, and you just have to decide. And that, that was one that, was, that you know, we look back on, we were flying back on the planet, and we say, man, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> well, um, I would say that the, the most exciting story was, I think I already talked a, a bit about it, was when, when uh, w you know, we started at Baby Center. I was uh, one of the 
first uh, employees there, and we were a very small group. And we grew from about um, in, like, 10 people to 100 people within a, a short period of time. And, I, and then I remember the night when they called us in to say that we were going to be acquired by uh, eToys and that we were going to go public within a few days, just a few weeks after that. And, uh, and I remember uh, going home to tell my wife <laughs> that and, uh, and it being a very exciting time. Um, and and it, sort of, it was interesting because it sort of changed, you know, we were this small group, very intimate, and then suddenly we were part of this bigger company and doing something that was very public. And it sort of changed the, the, the culture and, and so how people interacted with each other and what people were focused on. And it, so it was good and it was bad at the same time, but it was uh, but, a very, but a very exciting time to hear that news and be called into the room and to, and to hear that. Um, and, and then to sort of segue, to, that's, that was sort of the most exciting. Then just to add on a quick other story from my CanDo days, uh, the, I think the most interesting thing was uh, they told me that I had to partner up with, with Ted Kennedy, uh, wh who was on our board, to do some projects around business development. And so I was, you know, uh, dealing with, uh, suddenly I was going to be hanging out with the Kennedys, and I just thought that was, like, the greatest thing. And it, it was a similar situation where we were... Uh, I was a little focused on the, uh, the the glamour and the and the opportunity, I guess, and then, uh, but we were less focused on on the business model, but uh, um, but but very interesting times. I mean, let's be honest: the uh, mid '90s to the late '90s was a ludicrous time period. <laughs> it was there was some crazy stuff happening. I mean, people were getting funded ridiculous amounts of money on crazy plans. Uh, people were going public when they had no revenue at all. Uh, there were a lot of, I mean, for, for us, uh, you know, when we first started buying advertising and the search engines first started selling advertising, we'd be able to get keywords for like three-year contracts exclusively and, you know, entire sections of search engines exclusively for not that much money. Uh, but the funniest stories were some of the companies that got funded that shouldn't have, like, um, I might get the name wrong, but what was the company, Cosmo, that used to deliver, you know, pints of Ben & Jerry's, or whatever you wanted, but they'd bring like one pint of Ben & Jerry's ice cream. Not take tips, and, you know, they raised $100 million or something like that. <laughs> and, you know, they spent it all in like a year and went out of business, and it was, it was crazy. Um, but for me, I knew it was completely ludicrous. When you'd go to these small startups um, or medium-sized startup parties that had just been funded, and, uh, you know, Elvis Costello was playing at the party or something. And you were thinking, these guys are just blowing money faster than you can believe. I, like Jed, loved the uh, late 90s. Like, it was a great era. <laughs> <laughs> ben was talking about the personalized emails that Baby Center sent out to uh, its subscribers. And actually, it was my wife who was writing those emails. That was her job. That was her okay. words that were going out. So yeah, the eToys IPO, uh, that was the down payment on our house. So thank you, <laughs> dot com bubble. Um, but yeah, I know one of the things you want to talk about, Andre, at some point is, is this a bubble that we're in now? And, you know, I think back to that era and, you know, when you're raising money for a company, one of the things that you consider is, is this investor going to be with me through thick and thin? Are they going to be there for the B round and the C round? Is this somebody I can lean on and count on? And we raised the money for Keyhole, which is the company that created the Google Earth technology that was ultimately acquired by Google. And we... Uh, Sony had a strategic venturing arm, and they were our, they were our lead investor. And we were we met them in San Francisco. They had this beautiful incubator space. You know, incubators sound, sound familiar if you're kind of watching the current environment. We were wowed by the industrial design and all the sort of hip-looking people that were walking around. And um, you know, they you know promised to help us in any number of ways. And uh, so we did the round. They invested a sizable chunk of cash. It was about four and a half million dollars. And I had the unfortunate you know, uh, outcome of watching, you know, the guys who, of watching that fund essentially wind down and watching the guys, one of them actually get fired from Sony and the other guy transition off to something completely unconnected with venture. So not only were they not around for, you know, future rounds, the whole fund actually ceased to exist. So um, that was a good lesson, you know, it was, a, it was a hard way to learn it. So since you brought and up yes, that we're in a bubble. Since you brought up that question, <laughs> anyone else want to anyone want to talk about the current bubble today? I know I, Jed, I know you invest these days, so Yeah, I, I, it's a different kind of bubble though. There's um <laughs> it's <laughs> the 
kind of doesn't pop. Stranger. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, it, it's certainly, uh, there's certainly companies that are getting funded that shouldn't and certainly valuations that are higher than they should be. Um, but there's also phenomenal success stories that are happening right now. Uh, companies that are growing really fast and deserving of the big valuations they're getting. Uh, we don't see the craziness as much at the earliest stage, or at least we certainly don't participate in it. Uh, I think the earliest stage rounds are reasonable. They're raising a reasonable amount of money. The valuations are reasonable. It all makes sense to me. Um, I think some of the larger funds that uh, kind of insist on putting a lot of money into each company they invest in, uh, some of those deals get a little wacky. But um, I don't think it's, it's anywhere near the level of wackiness that we saw in the 90s, personally. Uh, the, the sort of bubble we're seeing is, is not so much like with healthcare IT companies so much, but we, there's a, a lot of people talking about is there a healthcare bubble? Uh, is the amount of money that we're spending on healthcare uh, unsustainable? I think most people say uh, yes, it's unsustainable. But when is the point where the whole healthcare market is going <laughs> to implode because uh, all the jobs are going overseas and the employer-based uh, healthcare market is not working? Uh, and and it, right now the government is is uh, helping to provide some stimulus for that, but that's short term. And so when that goes away. Uh, will there be a, a healthcare bubble? And so, where are the opportunities if the market uh, ha is is receiving half the revenue that it is today? What, where are the opportunities for companies to come in and help the healthcare industry to uh, do the work that it does today uh, at half the revenues? And and that's the problem that we're struggling with. So we do have a couple minutes for questions. So if anyone's interested, I could I could talk to these guys all day. So. Uh... I would, I would love to go on, but if anyone has some questions, uh, please ask and uh, speak in the microphone or I can repeat your question. I wonder if the panel would address um, a couple of different dimensions. Uh, the first one is, what companies did you see that were deserving that ended up not getting funding or failing because of the uh, the uh, anti-bubble, the, the, the last couple of years that we saw. And the second thing is, um, what, what are your opinions about the potential disconnect between um, the very large funds, the very large IPOs, uh, the huge capitalization that chase after really good big deals, but then uh, what happens to the smaller companies that are deserving but are not getting any attention? Uh, where is the capital coming from? I can take the second part of that question. I, have to, I, I was unclear with the first part if you meant the, during the 90s or now. But on the second part, the, um, what I'm seeing at the earliest stage is there's a lot of funding out there. The, the good ideas and the good teams are getting funded. It's extremely easy to rate seed financing right now. And the seed financing, um, you know, whether it's 10 people each putting in 25 grand, whatever it is, it gets you enough of a runway where you should have an opportunity to impress the Series A investors. And uh, it's pretty easy to raise that right now. So I don't see a lot of good businesses or good teams even being unsuccessful raising that seed round. I'll, I'll take the, I think, what I think is your first question, which is, is kind of, an, I assume you mean in the early 2000s in the, in the bust. Um, oh, oh you, mean the, you mean the very recent, the, the inability for people recently to get funding. Well, I, I sort of back up on the inability to get funding as a, is, is there's, there's really a bigger issue in entrepreneurship, which I think is a, is a great positive. So, so cycles come and cycles go. And when we were students uh, and we took the entrepreneurship class, they always talked about the window. They said, the window opens and the window closes. And when the window's closed, wait. And when the window's open, run as fast as you can because no one can tell you when it's going to close. You just know it's going to close. And, and I know, you know when I worked for that company where the CEO said we're going to go public in nine months, look, we all knew it was insane. There was no one in that room saying, um, you know, this is going to last forever or this is, this is completely rational. And that's why we ran like crazy. I was the CTO and the CMO of that company. And uh, uh, that, was a, that was kind of a mistake relative to sleeping for, uh, for the next two years. But, but one of the trends, but really getting back to the trend, and one of the reasons I think this bubble is a little bit different is the size of team and the size of investment needed to create a company 
not in every industry, but in, in software and mobile and IT, has gone down so dramatically. You don't need to buy servers. Um, I mean, one reason Adam saw uh, that, Ad that uh, Kevin and I shared was so valuable is he'd done parallel operating system work here at MIT, and he could create an entire cluster, parallel operating system cluster of computers that could scale up incredibly well. Now you can rent that from Amazon for eight cents an hour, I think. Um, and so the companies are actually a lot smaller, and they're taking less capital. And I think in some of the industries where you need more capital, like the biotech industry, you're seeing a slowdown in exactly what you were talking about, which is funds have a lot of money. They only want to make larger investments. So that creates a bigger gulf in the middle for, for comp you know, companies may be able to get seed stage, but they kind of can't get that, that next level of funding. I would say on the software and IT side, and anyone feel free to disagree with me, you're not seeing that. Uh, as much, and that is because you can, because of the changes in technology and frankly the changes the internet has brought, you're seeing smaller, much more efficient companies, and, and so hopefully the macro trend is, is to the positive. I don't, I don't have an answer to your question, but I just have kind of an observation. I had an opportunity to kind of see that from the inside of Google in the 2009, 2010 period, and I thought one of the smartest things that Eric Schmidt did was explicitly send the company on a buying spree during that downturn. And uh, you know, he said, we're going to go out and buy 100 companies. I think I forget the exact quote. I think it's out there. Uh, but he just geared up Corp Dev, knowing that there were great teams and great technology that were out there and available at essentially fire sale prices. And Google got a ton of great talent during that period. So uh, you know, it's a problem on one side, but it's an opportunity uh, to take advantage of. It's kind of hard to go against the herd mentality. Uh, but Eric really set the tone and, and did that. And it was a good call. Great. And this will be the, the last question. Uh, today's environment for the, um, both the entrepreneur and also the venture capitalist, what is the desired exit strategy? And in the event the answer to my question is not an IPO, what would need to change in today's environment such that the desired exit strategy is an IPO? I'm not sure that should be the goal. Um, even in the uh, best IPO times, something I think the quote is something like 85% of venture-backed companies exit through M&A, not through IPO, when the times are really good. Uh, with all the um, uh, you know, restrictions on, on uh, management right now in terms of uh, <coughs> taking a company public, most of them actually don't want to do it. It just seems like a big pain to them. So uh, I think a lot of times their preference is actually being acquired. Uh, so I, I'm not sure the goal should be an IPO. I think the goal should be building a um, long-term, high-growth, sustainable business. And when the time is right, you kind of figure out if, you, you know, if, if an IPO makes sense or if an uh, a, you know, M&A transaction is, is exciting enough. I do a lot of work with uh, uh, Intel Capital, and Intel Capital does more deals than any other uh, venture capital company, and and very few of those deals are they look to IPO as the exit strategy. There's I think, <coughs> ten or twelve types of different exit strategies that we have on the list. Some of it's integrating it into Intel. Some of it's licensing the technology, some of it is uh, selling the companies. You know, there's a whole long list, and, and uh, focusing on an IPO usually is not a very valuable use of time. All right, well, thank you. Let me thank our, thank our panelists.